Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2016 Warren G. Harding Symposium entitled The American Presidential Candidate, Reality versus Illusion. My name is Gary Imes, and I chair the Symposium Advisory Committee. We're about to begin our afternoon workshop sessions, but before we do, I'd like to direct your attention to the opening page of your program booklets. There we have listed our symposium partners, advisory committee members, and community partners. Without the support of these organizations and individuals, an event like this would simply not be possible. And though they are not listed in your program, we're also grateful to the generous support of the Fay Banking Company. Thank all of you so very much. I also want to introduce some special guests this afternoon. First is the site manager of the Harding Home Presidential Site, an author and a frequent presenter of the Harding Symposiums, and my former student, Sherry Hall. <laughs> and from the Ohio History Connection, I know we have Aaron Bartlett here today. Is Steve here? Okay, Aaron, thank you for being here. Dr. Ryan McCall is the president of the Marion Technical College. Ryan, will you stand? Thank you so much, Ryan, for providing this wonderful room for us today. Isn't this a nice venue for this event? And finally, representing the Harding family is Dr. Warren G. Harding III, grandnephew of our nation's 29th president. Warren, I know you're here. There you are. Thank you all to our guests. And now let's begin. Our, our format for this afternoon will be, as you can see in your program, we have allotted for each presenter an hour and 15 minutes, including their presentation, plus questions and answers. Then we've built in a 15-minute intermission in between each session. Feel free to, to have more refreshments in the, in the lobby there. Restrooms are out there. I think you'll find that uh, you'll be very comfortable. And then at the, at the end of our final session today, if you are joining us for dinner tonight, and many of you are, that's going to be in the same venue that we've been using, and that's in the Guthrie Community Room in Maynard Hall. Two ways to get there. If you parked here, you can drive around to the, to the faculty lot, which is closest to Maynard Hall. There are signs that will direct you that way. If it's a lovely evening, like I'm predicting it is, you can just walk across the bridge and go over to Maynard Hall. It's a lovely stroll across there, especially on a nice, uh, mild, sunny or summer afternoon. All right, let's get going here. Our first session is called Dazed and Confused, What We Know and What We Don't Know About Presidential Elections. Dr. Daniel M. Shea joined Colby College as the director of the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement and professor of government in 2012. Page two. <laughs> previously served on the faculties of the University of Akron, Lafayette College, and Allegheny College. Dr. Shea is the author or editor of more than 15 books and dozens of articles on the American political process. He continues to pursue research on campaigns and elections, the dynamics of the party system, the changing nature of the presidency, the politics of scandal, and grassroots political activism. In 2012, he authored Let's Vote, The Essentials of the American Electoral Process, and co-edited my favorite, Can We Talk? The Rise of Rude, Nasty, Stubborn Politics. Imagine that. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Shea. Okay, am I on? Thank you for that introduction. And I just noticed a major typo on that first page. It's not bode well for the rest of the presentation, but Typo deep in the, in the presentation is one thing, but on the first page, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to come back. Thank you for, to Gary and, and to Sherry for the sort of logistical help on getting here. It's nice to be back in Ohio. I did spend four years at the University of Akron. Uh, a really wonderful year working at the Bliss Institute with John Green doing applied politics. Um, I'm also grateful to be here to know more about Warren Harding. I teach the presidency, and I must admit, too often I sort of jump from Woodrow Wilson to Herbert Hoover, or the skip the 20s. 
I'm not going to do that anymore, I promise. <laughs> Sherry, I tell you, I will do a nice section on that if I could Skype you in to talk about all you know about Warren Harding. That would be great. Uh, an important presidency and also uh, an important election, a very important transformative election, 1920, which is what we'll talk about today. I think years from now, decades from now, We'll look back at 2016 as a very important election, a before and after election. I want to start, before I jump in, with telling you uh, about what prompted the title and the theme of the chat. I was driving in the car one day, listening to public radio, and a friend of mine, a Colby grad, Amy Walter, jumped on and was talking about the 2016 election. And Amy's, uh, she writes for the Cook Political Report, and she's about as smart as they get. And it was early in the primary season, and one of the callers raised a question about Donald Trump, and she said, she said, if you're worried, don't be worried. Donald Trump has a less than 0% chance <laughs> of becoming the nominee. <laughs> Amy Walter, again, is a really smart person who makes a living looking at these things, studying these things. And she couldn't have been more wrong, right, as we know. So it got me thinking about a lot of things that have changed, a lot of the fundamentals that we thought we understood about presidential elections and how they've transformed. So that's really what it's about. Oops. That's who I am. Gary uh, gave you that nice introduction. That's an old picture, as you can tell, but I'm sticking with it. <laughs> um, okay, so let's dive into it. So, students of politics, right? Poly, the Latin word, word for many. Tick is a blood-sucking creature. So, the students of politics, <laughs> that's an old one, I know. Students of politics have sought to define the rules of engagement, the fundamentals that shape the process, and to tell the rest of the world about them. We know from the prince, from Machiavelli, that the prudent man should always follow the path trodden by great men and imitate those who are most excellent. George Washington Plunkett, a party leader, the turn of the century in New York, said you must study human nature and act accordingly. Chris Matthews spent Dave Horowitz, the art of political war, the aggressor usually prevails. Tip O'Neill, all politics is local. And my favorite, when your opponent is drowning, throw the son of a bitch in the hand. That's, of course, James Carvel, the raging Cajun, um, which is linked to this. Speaking of rules, this is a famous sign in electoral politics. This goes back to 1992. And we all know of it, of it because of it's the economy, stupid. So in the war room where James Carvel and other, others were there trying to elect Bill Clinton, they reminded themselves of fundamental issues in the election. It was a stunning election for George H.W. Bush, right? So he goes from an 89% approval rating during the war, the Persian Gulf War, to losing the election. Right? Within a year, he lost from 89% approval rating to losing the election without any significant gaffe or any significant change. But what he didn't understand, what the Republicans at the time didn't understand, it was a fundamental issue, and that is the perception of the state of the economy. So in the war room, they listed, don't forget, it's the economy, stupid. I think it's also interesting that they write back in 1992, don't forget about health care. They often pass that over. In the wake of the 2012 presidential election, when Mitt Romney lost, the RNC got together to chart these fundamentals. How will we take the White House back? And this is their report, the Growth and Opportunity Project. And part of that report, deep in the report about outreach to Hispanic voters, there is a section where it says the Republican Party should be one of tolerance and respect. And we need to ensure that the tone of our message is always reflective of these four principles. 
Scholars have sacrificed a forest of trees trying to define the fundamentals, the rules of electoral engagement. I'm part of that, right? In fact, they suggest, scholars often suggest, that the effects of campaigns are rather minimal. The fundamentals are important. These are some of the highlight events from pre past presidential elections that some have thought were maybe even turning points. The debate in 1984 when Walter Mondale said he would raise taxes, the swift vote veterans for truth ads, did Sarah Palin really lose the election for John McCain and so forth, the tank ads for Mike Dukakis, the 47% debt that we all know from Mitt Romney. Those are small things, the fundamentals matter. Oops, I'm sorry, a little too fast. Long-term factors are what are really important, we're told by scholars, the science of electoral forecasting. Often scholars can make predictions about the outcome of a race with surprising accuracy six and eight and ten months in advance of election day. Well, how are they able to do that? It's by relying upon the rules, the fundamentals, the forecast components. Well, how are they holding up these days? How are the rules, the fundamentals, the forecasts holding up in the 2016 presidential election? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through 10, through 10 of them. In some cases, I think you'll agree that the rule's been shattered. doesn't seem to work. And other times, they're sort of abandoning. So let's, let's go through those 10 as quickly as I can, maybe in, I don't know, a half hour or 40 minutes, and we'll open it up to conversation. I've given this chat a couple times before, and the best part, to be honest, the best part is hearing from you all and having a conversation. So let's go through it. First, number one, big money rules. First rule, we all know this, right? So we've heard this, we thought this, after Citizens United, it opened a Pandora's box, a tidal wave of big money would flood the system, drowning out small players and leaving mid-level candidates marooned. Barack Obama said you now have the potential of about 200 people deciding who ends up being elected president. Big money will rule the day in 2016. Well, there's Donald Trump's fundraising totals um, from his own money in 2016. He spent no time, nor did he put any real effort into fundraising prior to now, right? So things are changing now. They're scrambling to raise money. I read this morning they don't, as of yet, have enough money for the convention in Cleveland. They're, they're seeking money now. But he didn't need super PACs. He didn't need massive pools of money for the nomination. Bernie Sanders told us the same thing. Individual contributions made up 99% of Bernie Sanders' coffers. Okay? And they're all small. 87%, I'm sorry, 80% were from donations of less than $200. Okay, you got me. Sanders didn't win the nomination. But he took it a long way, didn't he? And he didn't do it with massive super PAC assistance. Super PACs by January of 2016. Jeb Bush. Super PACs for Jeb Bush had over a hundred million dollars. Cruz and Rubio, 30 and 31, or 38 and 31. Where did they end up? So we're calling into question, we're starting to rethink some of this money issue. Is money an important factor in elections? Absolutely. Was it critical in the nomination process this time around? Maybe not. Let's talk about the invisible primary. Well, what is the invisible primary? Um, the invisible primary is what happens behind the scenes prior to Iowa and New Hampshire. The building up, the process of gathering support and endorsements. So the party decides, which was a really important book, 2008, did a comprehensive study of endorsements made in presidential nominating contests between 1980 and 2004. They find that early endorsements 
in the invisible primary are the most important cause of the candidate's success in state primaries and caucuses. 538.com, a, a blog that we all pay attention to, or a lot of people pay attention to, on electoral politics said in presidential primaries, endorsements have been the best predictor of who will succeed and who will fail. Okay. That's a graphic of endorsements. The larger the bubble, the greater the number of endorsements. I like this a little better. There's Marco Rubio's endorsements. What we did was we listed all the members of Congress, senators and representatives and governors who've endorsed candidates, who endorsed candidates prior to the convention. Marco Rubio's endorsements. There's Donald Trump's. Okay, there's Hillary Clinton's. And there. And there. Okay. And there's Bernie Sanders. Okay, again, you got me. Sanders didn't win. But he took it a long time. He took it a long ways. Right. How important were endorsements this time around? How important were the elites, were the newspapers, were other elected officials' support of candidates? Maybe we're in a year when that, that rule is just either broken or less important. Number three, front-loading matters, right? So front-loading is the process where early primaries and caucuses decide the fate of the nomination battles quickly. They end before others have had a chance. Um, when I was at Allegheny College, which is just across the border in Meadville, Pennsylvania, I was part of an election reform task force, a statewide election reform task force. And one of the issues that was bemoaned is the Pennsylvania primary never seemed to matter. The problem was it was late in the calendar. Right? It was late in the year. So the argument was the system shuts down too fast. Early contests decide the contest. Iowa and New Hampshire are giving too much weight. Well, I suppose it still mattered, but it took a long time. It took a long time to settle the deal. In fact, it took an even longer time in 2008. Right? So Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton fought it out. And by the way, Pennsylvania mattered in 2008, right about the time I was arguing that it was too late in the calendar, we needed to move it up. Shortly after, Pennsylvania becomes critical in 2008, as well remember. Pennsylvania was a big state that time around. <laughs> I'm sure that's how Hillary feels. Okay. She won. She won. Uh, but it took a long time. And it wasn't a quick knockout. Right? I think if things moved along a little faster in the... Republican ranks, but even so, the value, the weight of Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada, I think we're starting to call into question. Right? I'm not so sure that in the future we'll assume that if you run the table in late January and early February, it's about over. In fact, we may see candidates start to skip those events or surely play down those events. Okay, number four, Republicans are values voters, okay? I referenced Tom Frank's book, What's the Matter with Kansas? It's, it's at least it's about 12 years old now, but it was a fascinating look at his state, Kansas. What he argues in that book is that when he was growing up and when he was a young man, if there were economic concerns, if the workers in his county or in his town or given the shaft, if there was deep economic turbulence, they would turn to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was able to win the blue-collar working class vote in Kansas once he was growing up. What he argues is by the 1980s and 1990s that when the working class was given the shaft in Kansas, they quickly turned to the Republican ranks. So why would it be true? We can also remember in 2004, Howard Dean 
making this impassioned argument when he was running for the presidency, why don't we have those guys in the South that work for minimum wage, that don't have health care, that don't have retirement, why aren't they Democratic voters? Well, the answer is, and what Frank said, is that social value issues became more important for a large number of these voters. Setting aside economic issues, you have issues of school prayer and abortion and gun control um, and a host of gay marriage later on and so forth. So we assume that at the core of the Republican voter are values. In fact, in 2008, that seemed to be the case. If you look at those first two lines, these are for Republican voters, 70, what is it, 74% suggested that values-related issues are very important or somewhat important. Ted Cruz surely led this data. Ted Cruz's candidacy was based on this values-based supposition. So are Republican voters values voters? <laughs> Where'd that go? Where'd that go? I think it's possible that Donald Trump is trying to build back some of that value-based electorate with his choice of Mike Pence as a vice presidential candidate, purely a value-based pick. But for a heck of a lot of Republicans, it didn't matter this time. For a heck of a lot of, I mean, Donald Trump has taken abortion, for example. Donald Trump has been all over the map on the abortion question, all over the map. But it doesn't seem to matter. You know, he's had, well, as we know, um, the picture on the right is, you know, the profanity issue. And he's a lot of profanity, which doesn't seem to matter. Stuff that we would assume, if we would have, if Amy Walter would have imagined that Donald Trump would use this sort of profanity so often and make such really outrageous comments that he would lose Republican value voters. But he didn't. So something's going on there. Speaking of the values voters, he's tried, he's tried, right? He's gone to, to give speeches at uh, colleges and universities, at Christian colleges and universities. I hear this is a major theme right here, the two Corinthians. That's the whole ballgame. Didn't hurt him, right? The two Corinthians. That's the whole ballgame. Over the decades, socially conservative, working class whites migrated to the Democratic Party to join the Republican Party, especially in the South. Socially moderate Republicans, especially on the East Coast, shifted to the Democratic Party. Now there's little disagreement within each party on social issues. You have a Republican voting for an LGBT candidate with a little flag there. I'm not so sure that graphic, that cartoon is spot on. I know the Republicans are having some internal debate regarding uh, planks of their platform regarding LGBT, gay rights issues at the National Convention. Well, they do know for a lot of young Republican voters, those sorts of issues are, are um, the Republican Party Young Republicans are less value voter, less value center than many other Republican voters. Fair enough. Okay, Reagan's eleventh commandment. Was Sherry? Didn't you tell me yesterday that this is something that Warren Harding also espoused that Republicans should not speak ill of other Republicans? I'm going to change this for the next time. Right? It's going to be an asterisk up there saying that Ronald Reagan got it from Warren Harding, right? <laughs> Thou shalt not sp speak ill of fellow Republicans. That was something that they seemed to adhere to. They surely did a better job at this than Democrats did through the years. Oops, I'm so sorry. Hope this. It's 
There it is. Sorry. Well, okay, Jeb Bush has low energy. But, Carly Fiorina, obviously another Republican. Look at that face. Would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that face as your next president? I'm George Bush. Say what you want. The World Trade Centers came down during his time. Imagine that Republican suggesting that 9-11 was the fault of another Republican. John McCain, I like people who aren't captured. Fox News, she had blood coming out of wherever. Ben Carson, temper. You don't cure these people. You don't cure a child molester. Pathological, there's no cure for that. And of course, my and Ted Cruz. And went the other way as well. Some thoughts about Donald Trump. Rick Perry is unfit to be president. A barking carnival act. Cancer on conservatism. Bobby Jindal said he's dangerous, a narcissist, an egomaniac. Ron Paul, Rand Paul, sorry, Donald Trump is delusional, narcissist, orange faced windbag. Wow. Lindsey Graham, you know what to do about how to make America great again? Tell John, Donald Trump to go to hell. And of course, Jeb Bush says he's a Billy Punchin back in the nose. So much for Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment. <clears throat> Let's talk about number six, partisanship. A while ago, not too long ago, by about 19, I'm sorry, 2008, we started to wonder if Americans were fading from uh, political parties, that partisanship was declining. Fewer and fewer Americans seemed anxious to link themselves to a party label. There was a rise of independence. This is, you see this growth by 2012 of independence, which is uh, the light colored green, decline in other partisanship. Sorry, I went too fast. But what we see is when we collapse leaners, that is, we ask voters if they lean towards one of the two parties, we get a partisan, a picture of a partisan electorate, much more partisan than one we would have thought. And it's even more significant than that. I want to pay some, I want you to pay attention to this figure for a few minutes. This is very important. What it is, is it is a spatial distribution of partisan preferences. So let's start with 1994. What you see in the blue is the position of Democrats on 10 issues. What you see in the red is the position of Republicans on 10 issues. What it tells us is that there were some differences between Republicans and, difference, and Democrats, but the differences weren't that small, or weren't that great. The lines are fairly close together. Right? So there are distributions of each party. Right? By 2004, right, was it very heated. By the way, let's get back to 1994. That was thought to be a very partisan time, right? That's the rise of Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton's midterm election. Things were getting pretty hot by 1994. But even so, the American electorate remained, remained moderate and remained rather close together, the Democrats and Republicans. We see that through 2004, but by 2014, the two parties had split. Right, so the average, the position of average Democrats, the median Democrats, has now moved dramatically away from the average position of Republicans. This is really important and significant. What it is, is that it is trying to bear down on what we mean by our partisanship. And what we found, what scholars have found, is that at the core of our partisanship is a disdain for the other side. We do not like the other side. We were talking about this, a couple of us, before the chat today. What we see is worry, 
concern that the other side is a threat to the nation. So 58% of Republicans have a very unfavorable view of Democrats, and 55% of Democrats have a very unfavorable view of Republicans. And when you try to figure out why we seem to be mired in gridlock, American politics seems to have so many difficulties this day, these days. This is at the root of it. This is just a quick look at how we feel about the other side. 46% of Republicans say Democrats are lazy, but on the other hand, 70% of Democrats say Republicans are closed-minded. We don't think much of the other side. Only 2% of Republicans think Democrats are honest, and only 5% of Democrats think Republicans are honest. It's tripped over into issues of where we want to live, who we want to spend our time with, and who we hope members of our family will marry. There's a growing pool of data to suggest that about a third of hardcore Republicans and a third of hardcore Democrats would be very upset if someone in their family married someone from the other side. This is a change in American politics. We're as partisan now as we've been in many generations. So much for the rule number six, the end of partisanship. This is a quick look at what's happening in Congress. I'll, let me show you a different one. I like this better. This is a graphic that takes a look at the voting patterns in the Senate. This is the Senate. And what you find is that there's a connections between each other. So the deeper the blue and the farther out here, the less likely these members of the Democratic Party are to vote with members of the Republican Party and vice versa. What you find is there are essentially two moderates. This suggests that Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins of Maine, not the only thing that's left in terms of sort of middle of the road legislators. Back can, to the, can you show us where Brown and Portman are on there? Okay. Please. Brown's in the center of the blue here. I can't find Portland. Lower right. Just above center. I'm sorry, just above who? Just above center. In the center above the center. Oh, okay, right. I would say, uh, you know, not on the extremes of their parties, but they're nowhere near the sort of the center of the, of the two-party system. I'll check to show you this. The interesting thing about this is the dark colored lines is the, so the mean vote, and the shading is the what's called the standard distribution, the spread. What you're getting is a movement farther away from each other, the voting pattern of the House and the Senate. And there are fewer and fewer that are willing or able to find common ground, to reach somewhere in the middle. So the polarization we see in the electric and we see in Congress. So much for the decline in partisanship. Okay, the end of realignment. So I think this is fascinating, right? Because I'm a, I'm a sort of a realignment guy who was beaten down through the years because I was told they it won't happen, they can't happen. So well, if you take a close look at American electoral history, you'll see big elections. You'll see elections that change the makeup of government, the policy agenda of government, the personnel of government for an extended period of time. 
All right, so in the, in the election of 1800, we have the Federalists and Adams being replaced by the Republicans. It was a big sweep. The Federalists lost the show. The Republicans came in. Really a high point in American history. One of the few times in world history when one government was replaced by another peacefully. Right? Adams wasn't happy about it. He left in the middle of the night and he grumbled and went back to Braintree, Massachusetts and was bitter for two decades, three decades. But he did it peacefully. And then, um, it actually should be 1828, which was when Andrew Jackson um, had his rematch with John Adams. 1860 was the big Lincoln-Douglas uh, Breckinridge election. McKinley was a big transformative election, 1896. Most scholars consider that election a realigning election because it shifted the direction of the Republican Party. McKinley ushered in a laissez-faire Republican business-oriented platform. Obviously, 1932 was a big election. Many suggest that 1968, well, the Humphrey-Nixon election was, was important, a big one of that sort. But scholars have said that's disappeared. We won't have that anymore in American elections because voters are no longer linked to party, uh, to partisanship, and their attention spans are short. We'll wind up with uh, a big election followed by a change election. So Barack Obama will win in 2008, but the Republicans will take over the House in 2010. So much for a realignment, it's two years. But things are happening in the Republican and Democratic Party right now. Things are, things are going on that are shifting mostly in the Republican Party. All right, let's just think, let's start with the Democratic Party. Jim Webb represented the old style Democratic Party of the mid 20th century. The party whose central appeal was among white southerners and northern, northern white ethnics. How far did Jim Webb get in the Democratic process? Like if Brother Jeb Bush pushed the neo-Reaganite synthesis of support for hawkish foreign policy and social conservatism and cuts in middle class entitlements to advance further tax cuts for the rich. He got nowhere. Right? Got nowhere. So Amy Walter um, and I and others, this is what I told my students, I said, you can take a look at all these other candidates you want. It's either going to be Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio. <laughs> Probably Jeb Bush. And then, right about the time Iowa was happening, I talked to a reporter friend of mine who had spent four weeks in Iowa. He said to me, Dan, I've spent four weeks here. I haven't run into one Jeb Bush voter. Right? We would have all picked him, right? We would have all picked him, or Rubio, maybe Ted Cruz, but we would have all picked those more establishment candidates prior to, prior to Donald Trump. Many have suggested that the old lines of cleavage are changing, that we're undergoing a realignment, and the shorthanded view of that change is an open versus closed line of cleavage. Closed as in pushing against free trade, immigration, social, social change, right? and open being for more sort of globalized free trade world. Think about free trade issues, for example. Where will free trade Republicans go in this election? Right? Most Republicans, like Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, and Mike Pence, by the way, Mike Pence, have lined up with free trade positions and have voted for these free trade acts. Donald Trump seems to be, wants to, wants to rip them all up. And immigration is also part of this, right? Do you see America, the future of America, as a more globalized, diverse, multi-ethnic, cultural world? Or should we make moves to bring it back to a more traditional view of America? I think we're in the midst of a dramatic change. I think the Republican Party 
a few elections from now will not resemble the Republican Party that we knew just a couple of years ago. But we can talk about that. <laughs> okay, paid media, Trump's earned media. So let's talk about another rule, number eight. There are two types of ways of getting media. One is to pay for it, to buy it. Those are advertisements. The good thing about paid media is it is controlled. You know exactly what you're saying to more or less the exact group of voters that you want to say it to. Right? If you buy the ad, you say what, what the ad will say, where it will be aired, when it will be aired. Okay? The downside for paid media is that it's expensive and it lacks a little bit of legitimacy. Voters don't pay a lot of attention to it. Earned media, on the other hand, you gotta like it because it's cheap. It's, we're talking about appearances, we're talking about press coverage, right? You can't beat the price. It's often, we used to call it free media. It's not exactly free, but it's awful cheap. But the downside is that it's not controlled. You can often make mistakes. Ask Dan Quayle about a spelling bee. He'll talk to you about mistakes. Right? We talked, you know, we talked about George Herbert Walker Bush. Do you remember when he was running in 92 and the economy was the issue? He wanted to show Americans that he understood the difficulties of paying your bills and going to the supermarket. So he put together a press event at a supermarket. He was going to go shopping. And he went shopping. And he went to check out, somebody had put money in his pocket, because I'm sure he hadn't had money in his pocket in a long time. But he was fascinated by this thing where you could take a product and move it across the screen. And he stuck with it for the longest time, which just completely highlighted that he had never really been to Super Bowl. I mean, he was a president for four years, a VP for eight years, a director of CIA and so forth. Okay, he hadn't been, but it was a gaffe that highlighted his sort of distance from average folks. So candidates have weighed the paid versus earned media rubric very carefully, very carefully. Do press events, but control press, event, press events because you might make a mistake. Oops, I keep doing that. Well, those are minutes of um, dollars. Uh, these are, these are, this is a graphic showing how much time each of the candidates got, the value of the time that they got online uh, in free media. So, for example, if George, I'm sorry, Jeb Bush would spend $82 million in paid ad, he got the equivalent of $214 million worth of earned media ads. So we take the amount of value in the earned media ad. Look at Donald Trump. This is through a few weeks ago. Right? Very little paid media, a tremendous amount in earned media. But of course, he doesn't make any mistakes. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's right. So think about all the gaffes that we thought would put Donald Trump away. All those mistakes that he had made that didn't seem to have any impact on his polling. He even said, I can go down Fifth Avenue and I could shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. So why not do, why not do, oops, why not do this sort of free media? Okay? Now, I only wanted to present 10 rules. So number nine is a whole bunch of them combined. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Donald Trump didn't spend a lot of money. He didn't do any polling. Surely candidates have to be consistent with their issue positions. He hasn't been consistent. He has no five-point plans. He just hasn't come forward with his book. Well, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say a policy-based book. He has his negotiation book. Potty mouth. Surely candidates need to watch what they say online. 
He celebrates greed. My whole lot, life has been greedy, greedy, greedy. He's unabashed about it. That's from a recent speech. He's insulted women, Hispanics, Muslim, people with disabilities, islands, the looks of other candidates. Can you imagine that? And even their wives. He's picked fights with all kinds of folks. Picking fights with media sources. Picking fights with a Fox News commentator, if you're a Republican candidate. And he surely, until we could argue, until more recently, hasn't acted what we thought would be presidential. Let me stop with this one. And then I'll open it up to some, some questions and comments. The, this is my favorite, and I've thought a lot about this. So V.O. Key was a very famous political scientist. He was the Lou Gehrig of political science, maybe even the Babe Ruth. He actually was one of the ones that discovered this realigning process. His last book is called The Responsible Elector. It was actually published after he died. He said the perverse and unorthodox argument of this little book is that voters are not fools. Many individual voters act in odd ways indeed. Yet in the large, the electorate behaves as rationally as we would expect. So I've been thinking a lot about this. And it's hard to pull yourself out of your partisan lens and say, well, what is the right choice? You know, I can give you one, for example, that, that maybe Democrats would grudgingly agree with. You know, when Ronald Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter, that was a bitter pill for Democrats. Many to this day think it was a right, a wrong move. Maybe the electorate understood what was going on in 1980. In the end, V.O. Key says, the voters are not fools. They'll do the right thing. And I've been thinking about that all spring as Donald Trump has, has cruised to the nomination. And I heard someone recently say, the reason why I like Donald Trump is because I know him. I've been watching him for 10 years. Of course, watching him on The Apprentice for 10 years. I think I'm a believer in V.O. Key. I think the voters are not fools. I think individual voters may act irrationally and may do odd things, but as a group, the American electoral will do the right thing. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, the fun part. We've got uh, oh, about 20 minutes or so. Comments or reactions? Yes, sir. I have one big problem with the presentation. You sort of left out the impact that my opinion is a major impact of the media. Give you one example based on your presentation. Uh, Trump got all this coverage from the media. Uh, Cruz got 300 something, he got 800 something, all of you got they got. What was the first question the media asked almost every other candidate about Donald Trump? Right. And not one candidate in the 17 ever had the intelligence to say to the media people, wait a minute, Mr. Trump speaks, the electorate will hear him, they will make their decision. You always complain, we do not speak about the issues. I'm here to speak about the issues. I'm not here to talk about Donald Trump. That would have cut out most of his publicity. Yes. And would have given them a chance to present that stuff. And the media knew exactly what was doing. Right. They created here, a here, everything you said is completely correct. Right? The media uh, created the Trump candidacy. And I think there'll be a lot of introspection after the election. Yeah. Uh, 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 almost, I think either way, particularly if he wins, but either way, about what they've done. Um, a tremendous amount of coverage. And, and you understand that, though. 
see, here's the thing. It wasn't a rule that was broken, right? The premise of my presentation. Because we always knew that the media was reader, viewer driven, listener driven. They're profit making organizations, right? They're also partisan, very partisan. And they're increasingly partisan, right? So one rule would have been that the media is objective, right? Which would have been a straw man. We knew that'd be true. But in the the reemergence of the partisan press is a really important story, right? But an important but, story is too when you, when you make an effort not to allow the other candidates to address anything with Donald Trump. And it was right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but yeah, okay, you can tell I'm not a Trump guy. I'll just lay my cards on the table. I'm not a Trump guy. But I gotta tell you, I'd open up the paper in the morning and the first thing I look for is something on Donald Trump. You know, sort of looking for the next car crash. I, my wife grew up on Long Island, and there's nothing worse for her than rubbernecker. If you've grown up there, you know anything about living in a high traffic area. If there's an accident, you don't slow down and look. You just cruise by, or else everybody behind you is going to be this cascade of sort of slow down. But I couldn't help looking at that crash over and over. I think, I think this huge, huge debate audiences, which Alan will get to this afternoon, for the Republican contest, I think a lot of those were Democrats. They're watching Donald Trump, this phenomenon, this guy that will say anything. All right? We've not seen anything like it. And um, I think some, some outlets have been worse than others. I, I, I watch Morning Joe a little bit on MSNBC. It's kind of an interesting morning program. And for the longest time, I think they have created the Trump candidacy and all of a sudden they got mad and now that Trump will go back on it. So there's there's also this 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 really exceptional feud between Donald Trump and several media outlets and that he attacks particular reporters in very vicious ways is exceptional. And of course we all know that he made fun of the disabilities of a of a reporter from the New York Times. It's a great part of the story. I'm sorry if I disappointed you by not talking about I know it's there. It's a big piece of what's happened. Yeah? Yes? Uh, your slides on the, uh, the loss of the moderates was very important to me. Uh, I lobby for a large steel manufacturer in D.C. And what we saw have seen, of course, off-year midterm elections are very hard on the president, you know, the person in yes. the White House. And, uh, what we saw in 2010 was a huge loss of the moderates, especially moderate Democrats who had supported Obamacare right. and supported the tap and trade for the environment, uh, and they all they all lost uh, unless they came from a very heavy Democratic area. Uh, and then with that, because it was a redistricting year, yeah. though, a lot of the state legislature. It happened in the state legislatures too, and so those were public, a lot of state houses split, and uh, they had to do redistricting, and they tightened up. Uh, from what we've seen, all of these uh, many more congressional districts are not competitive. They're so yes. many competitive districts, so that you have a lot of Republican plus ten percent, Democrat plus ten percent. Very few districts that are truly competitive nowadays, and so if you could just comment on um, the effect of that, and, and I think it means that they have no, you know, they have uh, no incentive to compromise or to work with the other party uh, because they'll be attacked if they do. Um, and does this also mean, though, that we won't see? Uh, some return to more moderates until another redistricting. <clears throat> well, the redistricting is not the root of it. You're surely on to it, but I'm going to argue that redistricting is not it. Let me get to it. There's, there's what's happening in America is called sorting, and there are two types of sorting. The first is we're sorting the information we get. Right? So it used to be every morning, maybe, I suppose all of you still open the star, right? Isn't that the local payment? Um, used to be every morning 
we would read the same newspaper in the community, and we would watch one of three networks, television news networks, that were probably somewhere in the middle, ideologically in the middle. But with the rise of internet and the reemergence of the partisan press, what we do is we sort out the information we get and don't get. Cass Susteen, the scholar, said, each morning we open the daily me. So we go to those websites that are consistent with our own beliefs, and we block out the opinions of the other side. So one version is of sorting is we're sorting out the information. The other sorting, which I think is fascinating, is a geographic sorting. Okay, so the reason why I don't think it's redistricting is because it's happening at the county level as well. And county lines don't change. Let me give you a little bit of data. In 1976, when Jimmy Carter was going against Gerald Ford, only about 10% of the counties in the United States were lopsided victories by more than 10 percentage points. So more than 60%. Only about 10% were of that sort, lopsided. By 2012, it was 50% of the counties across the United States. Right? The number of competitive seats at all levels, not just at the House of Representatives, but in state legislatures and city councils, is getting fewer and fewer and fewer. Two possibilities. One is that people are living in the same area and developing a consistent ideology, so it's changing hearts. The other possibility is they're changing locations. So some scholars are believing that as people move, an important part of the criteria on where they will live is either overt ideology, right? Where do the liberals live? Where do the conservatives live? Or at the very least, lifestyle choices, which link very closely to ideology. So people are living in ideologically consistent neighborhoods, right? You don't want your kids to hang out with folks from the other side kids from the other party, you don't want to marry kids from the other party. So why not live in that part of the state or even that state? I knew of someone in western Pennsylvania that was moving to either Oklahoma or Texas because the family thought it was too liberal in Pennsylvania. They wanted to move to, yeah, I know, Pennsylvania. We're not talking Massachusetts or Maine or something. So, um, so when that happens, the action becomes the primary election, right? So members of Congress have no incentive, you're right, to, to moderate because they're fearful of being attacked. The real action becomes the primary election. So you have to be consistent for the primary voters on both sides. So, you know, Congress is stepping away for seven weeks. They haven't done anything. I know they would say, Paul Ryan said, they've done a few things. It was a failed Congress. But it's not Paul Ryan's fault. It's not Nancy Pelosi's fault. Right? It is the voters back home that will not tolerate moderation. As a whole, we might be a moderate nation. But back in those counties, back in those neighborhoods and congressional districts, we're either staunchly Republican, staunchly conservative, or staunchly liberal. I think that's the root of the dysfunction. Yes, ma'am. I don't think you're um, talking enough about the outside money that's flowing into these smaller races. Oh, for like Senate races and so on? Like Koch brothers um, influencing races in states, um, going after smaller races. Yes. Like state house, yes. uh, this kind of thing. There's a lot of that going on that's changing people's minds. Yes, absolutely. All right, so we're just dealing with presidential, but I, you know, I would be, I would be so off base if I didn't say that money is still critically important in electoral politics. Your point's well taken. I'm going to add one thing that's increasingly different, and that is big money in judicial races. Yeah, yeah it is. It is just a huge change. Right, these sleepy little races that were based upon, generally based upon character and sort of integrity and these sorts of things 
are now being very, very expensive races with a lot of outside money coming in for understandable reasons, because these decisions at the court level can often shape public policy, as we know. Well taken, let's add to the judiciary the same thing in those states that have elections. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Um, you know, I mean, I think you're right. A lot of traditional rules didn't apply. Yeah. The question is why. And I, I would kind of argue that probably number one, a very high dynamic here is people are motivated by fear. You know, it's fear of our jobs going yes. overseas, fear of ISIS uh, attacking yes. this, fear of immigrants in general. And, and I think that, uh, particularly in, in Donald Trump's case, having that strong presence, I think, you know, attracted a lot of people. Um, but I think that's dynamics probably overrode, overrode a lot of these other dynamics. It's just the fear basis. Yep. You know, Donald Trump has a very populist appeal. And I think what a lot of commentators are suggesting is that it was a, a time bomb in the Republican Party, right? That the policies, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest what commentators are saying and not take this as a position myself. That the policies that Republicans in Congress, and we might say elite Republicans, the sort of laissez-faire um, deregulation sort of uh, free trade policies that seem to benefit corporate America have not translated into significant benefits for the working class. And that has happened over and over and over. And they have, the argument goes, these voters have been placated by uh, concerns about social issues. Don't worry about minimum wage. My God, they're going to get your guns. And that's been a time bomb ticking. And there was a point because of stagnant wages and this growing fear that America is in decline, that our children will not have as good a life as we have. That's a huge change that has been building and building and building. And it's exploded. And it's exploded in the Republican Party, Donald Trump, Exploded in the Democratic Party, too, with Bernie Sanders. I mean, an open socialist almost knocks off Hillary Clinton. I mean, a really strong run. It's happening on both sides. So I think the powder keg is the declining middle class, declining wages, productivity, those sorts of things. Yeah. It's a good point. Yes, sir? Well, what up on those comments? Say the Republicans had a genteel, charismatic, non-Trump man. So he's not said the inflammatory yes. comments, but basically has made the populist appeals. What do you think that type of candidate would probably win this election? He'd sweep the table. She, he'd exactly. sweep the table. It'd be over. He'd grab, he'd grab a bunch of those Sanders supporters. He'd grab all the Trump supporters. It would be a Harding-like election. Harding got 60%, right? 60, 60 more. 61. 61. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get this right, I'm in Harding country. Um, I would agree that this is a, a realigned election. I would agree with that. I've been saying that for most of the years. Yeah. And many times when you have realignments, you have chaos. That's right. You obviously have chaos yeah. this year. Yep. Yeah. Because of Trump. I think if we get through this in another four years, six yeah. eight years, we're going to see the, the alignment you're talking about. I think so too. I think a lot of working class Democrats will wind up shifting away. I think a lot of even business centered free trade Republicans might come back in the other direction. Um, yep, I agree. And I also think a squared away populist Republican would have swept the table. I don't know what our two experts at the top think, but I, I, I think it would have been just, yeah. Yes, sure. Following up on his comment, why didn't Kasich catch on? Well, I think, right, so I'm looking at some national polling. If he was the candidate, he would have just, you know, but you got to get through that Republican primary process. And here's, here's the snag, right? 
In a caucus state, only about five, maybe eight percent of the voters come out. In primary states, it's maybe 20 percent at the most. So of the five percent or 20 percent, what are they like? Are they, they tend to be more ideological. They tend to be more extremists. Um, Ted, Maine is arguably the most secular state in the Union, Maine. It's interesting. People basically don't go to church in Maine. I'm serious. Ted Cruz won. Ted Cruz won state of Maine. I was flabbergasted. Well, how did he do it? He flooded the caucuses. This is, you know, it was a large turnout for a caucus, but still only, I don't know, 15% of the Republicans came out. Ted Cruz won. So I think that I think that he represented a more moderate wing of the Republican Party. It didn't serve him well uh, with the Republican primary and caucus goers. That's my best guess. And you might also say that some of his positions, he wasn't out there in a more populist direction as Trump was. Right? I don't know what is his, what's his position on free trade, for example. Probably, probably supported. He probably voted for. He probably voted for NAFTA, didn't he? He did. Yeah, as a congressman, he voted for NAFTA. If I could say, um, I, I voted for Casey, but and I agree with comments. But in his case, from personal experience and what I picked up with the Republican establishment, he didn't have friends. He didn't make friends on a personal yeah. level, either within the state or nationally. Even Ohio Republicans who may support him, he wasn't afraid to say no or not respond nicely to him in all cases. He was a very independent person, which you can admire, and many people would admire, but in working in the Republican primary, you need friends, and he didn't have friends. He didn't connect on a personal level with enough Republicans across the country. It's, it's interesting how the rules of politics seem to sort of bubble back up, and then we remember Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have any. Not only did he have no friends, he wasn't liked. Nobody in the Republican sort of establishment liked Donald Trump. I understand the Kasich thing. I read about that. I sort of heard that too. I don't know. Many of you probably know him personally. Here he's he's kind of gruff and sort of you know, uh, and that probably didn't didn't help. But I think that was the ticket this year. Other comments or thoughts? Way in the back. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, so you make the comment that there's evidence that the American electorate is as far polarized as that is as that event. Why? Oh, 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 sorry, many generations. Yes. So I wonder, it's sort of hard to make that inference uh, uh, from mass electorate in that we've only got about 50 or so, 60 or so years worth of scientific data on mass attitudes and the Almira studies, yeah. American Conscious studies in the 60s. Then you also make the point that if you look at the voting patterns of members of the US Congress, we see these very clear clusters. And I think a separate picture of members of people that either we nominate or any of the ideal, any of the ways that we scale uh, members of Congress. And what we instead observe is the last 50 years is probably the anomaly in that the historical forces of American politics have probably driven people to the edges. The institution design have a system marked by gridlock. And it's probably the case that the last 50 years were the historical anomaly where the exigencies are foreign threat and nuclear incineration, the fact that the Cold War forced the political parties together. So is it really that we're in a period of historical anomaly, or is this more the mainstream? Uh, is this the long-term equilibrium of American politics? Well, okay, you're right. We don't have polling data prior to, like, 1950. Andy Esco's 1952. Yeah, 1948 is about as early as we get polling data, so we didn't ask these questions about partisanship. We do have voting patterns. Um, for towns and communities and for legislators. Um, we're as polarized in the percentage of times where members of each party in Congress stick together and vote as a coherent block is at historic highs. Um, we were, uh, there was much more, there was much more um, sort of moderation or shifting back and forth in the 60s and 70s, but that was a little bit of an anomaly bit centered on Southern Democrats, right? So we all know that Southern Democrats were a very conservative lot. So as Johnson and later Nixon were moving forward through civil rights legislation, it was the Democrats that were voting against a lot of these bills, Southern Democrats. 
So um, it's hard to it's hard to know because we don't have that polling data. We do have party unity scores in Congress. Um, I think maybe some of our presidency scholar friends could tell us about the sort of moderation of of policy positions of presidents. <coughs> could help to help us sort that out. Yes. Um, I don't know if you could maybe address this and maybe a bigger topic than we have time for here. With what you showed up here, is there a precedent in other political cultures in many other countries that, I know it's kind of apples and oranges, but that would be similar to what we're seeing right now? Well, I don't do a lot of comparative work, so that would be tough. I could ask some, some of our other scholarly friends to help us with that. But I can tell you, historically, it has the markings of a realigning period. The one thing that we don't have that's consistent with a realigning period is a growth of minor parties. So at nearly every one of the realigning periods we've mentioned above, or on the PowerPoint, there are a whole bunch of minor parties nipping at the edges. And then what happens is that there's a realignment, and they coalesce into two political parties. Right? So I'll give you another characteristic of realignment is turnout. At almost all the realigning elections, turnout goes through the roof. Well, we're seeing that. We're going to have a discussion about uh, the viewership of the primary um, debates through the roof. What's your guess about, about for example, the viewership of the presidential debates this time? It's going to be through the roof. Now, the one variable that we're not quite sure about is young voters. Right, so young voters came out in big numbers in 2008 and 2012, and they brought Barack Obama to power. 65% of those under 30 voted for Barack Obama. It's argue, I don't think it's arguable, but we could ask Mo this question. If it wasn't for young voters in Iowa, uh, would Barack Obama be president? No. Right, Hillary would have won Iowa. She won, she won New Hampshire. She'd have run the table, the front loading. Young voters made a difference in 2008. What about them this time? Uh, it's hard to imagine a massive sort of change, realigning election without young voters, without the youngest generation being part of it. My guess is they're going to be there, and it's going to be a big change election. Yes? That was going to be my question. Was what, what does this look like in, if this is a realignment, what does this look like? We have, these are old people who are running. Um, <laughs> You have a, a 70-year-old and a 69-year-old. What happens in four years? Well, you get... And, and yeah. where, does, where do those young people, particularly those young people who, who were Sanders supporters, where do they go? Well, the Clinton folks hope they fold back in the Democratic ranks. They, that's the key variable for the Clinton. Clinton will she'll take our presidency in the White House if, if there's energy among that group again, in my view. Um, what happens is you get a lot of surprises, in the, I think, during these realigning periods. A lot of, a lot of upset elections. You remember Eric Cantor winning in Virginia? What the heck happened there? Who saw that? Right? Amy Walter predicting that Donald Trump, Trump has less than a 0% chance of getting the nomination. So what happens, I think, in these realigning elections is a whole bunch of changes that we didn't expect. Things are surprising. Um, it's entirely possible, I suspect, that the big change will be Donald Trump will be our next president. That would be the big change. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. I, I talked to a lot of people who are in my friends who were uh, in the Americans, males, I am astounded how many of them are in the Trump team. And I think that this is because they are fearful of the demographics in this country changing, that their women are becoming more uh, tending, tending to, to come in larger numbers with the Democratic candidate, or they may go for the Republican candidate. But take blacks and Latinos, all of these groups are gaining. And the, the white males, especially non-college graduates, uh, are afraid of losing control 
of the country. I talked to uh, people and uh, people that I think thought should be Democrats, and here they are in Trump's camp, a millionaire uh, who has taken every sleazy deal that he can get to make money out of whatever he's doing, and they he has he has been able to, to draw these people in. So it's going to be a battle between women in this country who predominantly are more likely to vote for a liberal candidate, like the liberal yep. and the blacks and Latinos who don't like Trump, and that, that will be a battle that goes on. Because okay. we don't see moderation in, in the country <coughs> by anybody, because any candidate on either side yeah. who mm -hmm. ends up as moderate is is instantly attacked in the primary. Yeah. That there are people out there, big money people, who will pour money into that election to make sure that, that moderate goes down. They Is that my call to end? <laughs> Here, I'll say really quickly. It has, it's, it's been going on for a little bit. So right, 2008 was a huge change election. Right? So we have first African-American president. You've got a woman as Speaker of the House for the first time, an openly gay member of Congress heading up a critically important committee. And then we see the rise of the Tea Party. So the, the subtext or the, the urban myth of the Tea Party was it was an economic-based movement but you take a look at the number one reason why people joined the Tea Party movement, it was fear of immigration. And the Tea Party was composed mostly of white men, and often affluent white men. So I'll leave you with the argument that my colleague at a different university, Central Michigan, is making. She sees uh, Donald Trump as a sort of last bastion of white patriarchy. Patriarchy right? it is the last grasp for white men in a changing America. And that's why they're there. That's her argument. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.